we want to keep some, some, some time for a short Q&A session. So after this very comprehensive and interesting uh, keynote uh, session, we have more to come with our international panel. But we will, we will start with um, Christophe, with, with Africa. So we, for our way, we have been reviewing uh, Europe, and uh, Raoul already started to, to cover part of it. He will do so, uh, and he will, all, he will cover two more regions, uh, North America and Latin America, thanks to him. So without further ado, I'll give the floor to, to Christopher. Thanks, Simon. Um, we in uh, Cape Town, Research IC Africa, is a network of 20 universities across Africa. We're wondering what the future could be for fixed line incumbents. Telecom South Africa is trading at uh, a third of its net assets at the moment, and uh, many other um, incumbents are also struggling. So the question would be, should we just leave them to die, or is there policy issues that we have to address? And would fixed broadband have a chance? And if it does have a chance, how would this chance look like? So we are cooperated here with Learn Asia as well. And um, what we did is we combined national representative household survey data for 2012 from 12 African countries together with broadband baskets. And we started off with the ITU basket and then we developed also our own baskets in order to see what are the pricing strategies. And does fixed broadband at the moment pose a credible alternative to mobile broadband? These are the figures that the ITU gives us on individual internet users. We all know how flawed this data is, but it shows, well, because it's not based on surveys, but on estimations, but it shows that there's an incredible take up at around 2005, 2006, 2007, and 2008. And uh, this incredible take up is the transition from the old internet model to the new internet model. The old internet model was computer laptop at work or at school or at a library or internet cafe. It required a computer, Windows, Microsoft Explorer, viruses, <coughs> quite a high skill level, and it required electricity at home. Most Africans don't have electricity at home. Some countries more, like South Africa, and Namibia, and Botswana. In other countries, it's uh, less than 10%, less than 5%. So these were serious obstacles to adoption of uh, broadband at home. The uh, new form of internet is now via the mobile. It requires less skills, everyone can use it. It um, doesn't require electricity at home, and it's prepaid, which has been the success for voice applications, and it's now also the main driver for um, the data applications. And one thing that the internet does is, it's, um, and I shouldn't actually say internet anymore, because most people don't know that they're using the internet. If you ask them, do you use the internet? They say maybe no. If you ask them, you use Facebook? They say yes. So internet becomes an abstract term, like you wouldn't call your grandmother on her PSDN line. You, you just call her. So um, we find that uh, there's an expensive part to it and a cheap part. So poor people would use the internet to save money. Because on Facebook Zero, you can communicate for free, WhatsApp, mix it. But still, it's too expensive to use otherwise. So you can't be downloading video clips in Africa because it would be too expensive. But generally, we see that now that we have a huge adoption uptake. And uh, we ask people in our household surveys, 15 years or older, whether they used it first on a computer, those that use it, or first on a mobile phone. And we see that in a, a large number of countries, like in Uganda, 72% of internet users used it first on a mobile phone. And those that first used a mobile phone are likely to only use a mobile phone. While for those that used it first on a computer, they may now just use it additionally. So we saw a, um, a flattening out of the adoption curve of uh, internet take-up in Africa due to limitations of permanent income, electricity at home, computer literacy, and so on. And this has now been breached by mobile technologies. We also asked internet users where they accessed it, and uh, except Cameroon and Ghana, the main source of access is the mobile phone. In Cameroon and Ghana, it's still the internet cafe. But it wouldn't be access at home. So given that mobile is now so dominant in closing the data gap, the question is now what could fixed broadband do? So our baskets start out with a one gigabyte basket at 256K, 
which is ridiculously slow nowadays for broadband, but this is the official ITU definition. And we just looked for ADSL products at, uh, for one gigabyte, for five gigabyte, and for uncapped ADSL, and then see a sort for mobile applications that could match these baskets. And I'm presenting now not all 12 countries, just a few selected countries, and I grouped them into three categories. The first category is South Africa, Botswana, and Namibia, and these are three countries that have a sizable fixed-line residential market. Sizable means more than 10% penetration, but still less than 20% penetration. So very different situation compared to Europe. And um, if I take South Africa, for example, 18% of households had a fixed line in 2012. More, 245 had a computer, and about 20% had access to the internet. So you have a higher number of households with access to internet than you have uh, fixed lines. In terms of mobile use, about a third of South Africans use a mobile phone, and 70% uh, or 71% use it on a mobile phone. And 35% started using it on a mobile phone. Now in terms of pricing, one can see that ADSL is more expensive in all three categories, in all three baskets, for one gigabyte, for five gigabyte, and even for uncapped. And uh, prepaid mobile or postpaid would be cheaper. And the specialty here is that the cheapest product for the one gigabyte and the five gigabyte basket is actually the fixed line operator itself. They launched a mobile arm and now competing with a fixed line, and uh, those are the cheapest. Only for uncapped, it is another operator. And uncapped in Africa means subject to fair, fair use policies. And in South Africa for MTN, this means after three gigabytes, the speed is uh, reduced to 256K. So it's in theory uncapped, but um, practically it becomes quite slow then. For the case for Botswana, there is no uncapped products, neither for mobile nor for ADSL. That means mobile operators would find it very easy to replicate the ADSL model, and ADSL doesn't stand much of a chance. Generally, 15% of the households have a, a fixed line phone, computer about the same, internet at home, quite rare, with 8.6%. A third of the people in Botswana use the internet, 71% as well uh, mobile, and 46% used it first on a mobile phone. So here, ADSL doesn't stand much of a chance because they're not offering uncapped, and only if it would be uncapped would they have a chance against mobile. For Namibia, 11.5% of the households having internet, uh, having a fixed line, 15% uh, computer access, 11.5% as well for our internet, and altogether 16% of adult Namibians use the internet. 87% on a mobile phone, and about half only used it on a mobile phone. And Namibia is one of these countries which was quickly overtaken by mobile penetration, data penetration compared to fixed penetration. And looking at the prices, only in the uncapped segment, 48.7 US dollars per month, would uh, fix and have a chance. It's uncapped and uh, reasonably fast, up to 10 megabits per second. However, we have LTE in Namibia as well. And uh, this unlimited, uncapped postpaid product for 122 has at least five times the speed. So we have these two aspects that ADSL may only be competitive in terms of being uncapped, but then it's also so much slower. Plus, you have to deal with the incumbent, which means bad billing, bad services, you probably know the story in Belgium as well, isn't it? It's Belgacom. So then the second group has only one country, which is no competition, neither in fixed nor mobile. It's not North Korea, it's uh, Ethiopia. And uh, Orange is invested in it. So here we have 4% fixed lines in, in a household penetration, and uh, individual usage of the internet, only 2.7%. Extremely, extremely low no uncapped services, and uh, not even broadband uh, mobile prepaid services, only postpaid or uh, ADSL, which is a very limiting factor. And in uh, Namibia, uh, in, sorry, in Ethiopia, until recently, one had to recharge roughly for 20 euro in a month in order to keep your prepaid line, the voice line, which was an incredible burden and uh, reduced the take up. In the third category, we have countries which are having hardly any fixed line penetration. And an example is Kenya, which is a very dynamic market. 0.6% of households had a working fixed line. 
and uh, but 12.7 percent had a mobile or uh, had internet connectivity, which would mostly be mobile. A third of Kenyans use the internet, and about 80 percent, 78 percent actually started, uh, sorry, use it on a mobile phone, and 30 percent started using it on a mobile phone compared to a computer. So here we have a transition from the old system of internet cafes to the new individualized form of internet access. The interesting aspect for Kenya is that there is an operator that provides uncapped prepaid mobile access services per day. So for half a dollar, you have uncapped data services for an entire day. And this is a concept that could be replicated also for fixed line. One could say you have a flat rate pricing only for a day, and then you pay for one day. And prepaid is a tool that is most suitable for the poor, and 90% in Africa are poor, at least for European standards. So this is then a model that where the fixed line operator could be thinking if they transfer this, they may have a bigger chance. One can see neither for postpaid mobile or prepaid mobile, ADSL would stand a chance. Despite the ADSL provider, which is now orange, giving away free fixed lines with the ADSL. So it's no longer that one gives the ADSL line to a customer so they don't cut the cord. It's like if you get ADSL, we give you a free fixed line and uh, it's even prepaid. In Nigeria, there is uh, no information on ADSL. Most people don't know actually whether that exists still or not. And the operators seem to have gone completely fixed wireless. Fixed line penetration, 0.3% of the households have a fixed line. Computer, 6.6%. ADSL households, maybe 3.4%. 20% K- of Nigerians use the internet, and more than half use it first on a mobile phone. And 75% use it on a mobile phone on a daily basis, or at least frequently. So we see that uh, the fixed train has passed for Nigeria, and Uganda is also a very dynamic market. Fixed line penetration was pushed dramatically, more than doubled, from a very low base now to 1.5%, and uh, computer penetration 2.2% in the household level, internet household penetration less than 1%. Only 8% of Ugandans use the internet, 81% on a mobile phone, and 71% used it first on a mobile phone compared to a computer. So a complete mobile market altogether. Uncapped was only available through postpaid mobile, not through ADSL. So then the question is, what options would there be for a fixed line operator? How can you become profitable again? Should you just leave the sinking ship and start a mobile operation? And virtually all fixed line operators have started their own mobile operators. Either they were then sold off again or they restarted just recently, last two years. But this is now, they see there's so much profitability, so many revenues are pulled in mobile. Let's rather forget about fixed and um, go mobile altogether. However, there may be more profitable options. And more importantly, there may be options which would be more beneficiary for the country. And only having one source of technology may not be enough competition in the long run. So one option could be to focus only on the corporate market. Forget about the residential market. The corporate market needs their fax machines, better quality of voice, and um, it wouldn't be really desirable for Africa to lease the entire residential market only to mobile, but that might be still a profitable uh, avenue to go into. And actually we see that even new kids on the block like Neotelens in Africa just entirely focus on the corporate market. They have some residential products, but they don't really care. Price are not being advertised, and uh, no one is really interested in providing these services. The other option would be to have a data-only product, not to care about voice at all anymore. Just saying, you're getting a flat rate access, 10, 20 euros, and you can make as many calls as you like to whoever you want. And we don't even bother with this. It can just be any voice, Skype, or other voice providers. And... um, the strategy would here to convert all residential lines into ADSL lines, which means a conversion bo- or adoption boost of uh, about 90%. It's like we take away your residential line and we just give you ADSL router, which allows you to make calls. And uh, I calculated this model for Namibia. These are the turnovers for Telecom Namibia for 2009, 2010, 2011. And one can see it's roughly 700 million Namibian dollar in 2011, of which uh, 450 
is for data. So my question would then, could I replicate these type of revenues if I had flat rate pricing? And by dropping the ADSL prices by about 80 to 90 percent, I could have even more revenue than they currently have. So by just converting all the lines with some price discrimination for different speeds, one could easily replicate this. Taking into account price elasticities, I cannot just replicate it, but more than double this type of revenues. So it might be actually a, a valid business model. We've seen these business models in Europe, but we haven't seen these business models yet in Africa. A third option is to combine fiber to the home is expensive. Tomorrow there's a paper, which I'm very excited to, to attend and see the presentation, that estimates the cost of a fiber network rollout. And we all know it's going to be expensive, and uh, Africa has uh, vast distances, many different pockets, but at least for metropolitan areas, it may be profitable. In particular, if connected or linked, to premium TV content. At the moment, DSTV, the satellite service provider, has a quasi-monopoly in Africa, and the cheapest rate, which is 63 US dollar 40, is charged in Mozambique, where DSTV faces competition from cable TV. All other countries have a virtual monopoly. And if I would factor in this premium content, which one could deliver through fiber to the home, in addition to the internet and voice APUs, then this may become a viable option. So in conclusion, the voice battle has been lost in the last decade by fixed, and the data battle is also going to be uh, lost pretty soon unless decisions are being taken, uh, operators start investing in new technologies, and also redirect their business models. And uh, just fleeing the sinking ship and just jumping on mobile may not be the best option for all of our countries but it also has regulatory implications. The topics like local loop unbundling and uh, carrier pre-selection, which were hotly debated in Europe and partly implemented, are no longer relevant. Even if we would do local loop unbundling, who would want to un have an unbundled local loop of telecom? Neotel, certainly not, the provider. And why, why starting a business is going to die anyway? So um, the policymakers would need to refocus also their intention in thinking of how do we get competition in? Or should we aim for structural separation where we just provide open access regimes for national backbone and uh, leave the rest to competition? Thank you very much. Thank you, Bruce, also for keeping your time so precisely. Let's have some questions. I can ask one if you, oh. Claudio, introduce yourself. So, this is Claudio Feijo from the Technical University of Madrid, and I'm, I'm curious about one thing that you haven't mentioned. It's not related with exactly with infrastructure, more like uh, services and applications, but I see a number of innovations coming out from Africa. The, the biggest example maybe is mobile banking. And I would like you to, to if you can, to, to extend a bit on how you see the possibilities of, of this innovation coming south to north. If there, has, there is something specific in, in Africa going on in terms in, of innovation, particularly uh, around mobile, that can be exported to a certain extent. These innovations are normally arising out of resource constraints. In Africa, in particular in Kenya, maybe only 10, 15, 20 percent of households would have someone with a bank account. And when then postal services refused to deliver pensions to rural areas, which was used as a primary source, then an alternative had to arise. And this is this uh, mobile money transfer, which is not a banking service. It's um, an additional service. It's a different channel, and which is much, much cheaper. So for, for Belgium, I, I can't see how mobile money would be needed, since everyone here has a bank account. You start saving, or even in Spain, in primary school, getting erasers and pencils when you start opening a savings account and so on. It's, it's a very different culture. So often, out of necessity, then these innovations arise. But what we can see is that uh, the mobile application market is quite large in, in Africa. And uh, many services can be provided, and not many e-skills are actually being required for this. So e-health, e-governance, all of these services could be provided to even young people and old people without having much training because the mobile phone is what they use every day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
in, in the very rapid, uh, e extraordinary uh, uh, build out of uh, mobile uh, voice telephony, uh, some people have said there was an underinvestment in backhaul capacity uh, for the mobile network. And one uh, option, therefore, for the uh, fixed line carriers uh, is to uh, supply some of that capacity uh, uh, for cost. So I'm curious about whether that's uh, an option or whether that's a really marginal consideration uh, in, in the framework that you're examining. It's a very good point. It's a way forward. But um, there are many obstacles to this because the backhaul is normally owned by the fixed line incumbent, which is often state-owned. There's many political interests, and uh, the backhaul is being used to leverage uh, market power on other operators. So it's very difficult to establish the cost and to then enforce cost-based regulation, but this is what needs to happen over the next five years. Thank you. Uh, Scott Marcus here. Uh, first, thank you very much for a very clear presentation. Uh, second, I guess following up on, uh, on Claudio's line uh, in, in asking about uh, other innovations out of Africa, I, one that I've always been impressed with is the kind of uh, international mobile roaming arrangements that occurred in, in Africa that we haven't seen elsewhere, especially Zane. I know that, that uh, either you or your colleague Alison Gilwald have, have published on this. Could, could you give a quick explanation of how on earth that could happen? This is also an interesting case where policy had no involvement in. It just occurred out of necessity to build up a competitive advantage over Safaricom. Safaricom, dominant operator, 95% of the traffic, 92% of the subscriber numbers, and having a killer application in the network, which was mobile money. And uh, Zane, or Celta at the time, had to find some way to gain a leverage over this other competitive advantage, which were not telecommunication-based. And um, since they had licenses in other uh, neighboring countries, and had international gateways as well for voice and for data, they could then allow a single rate across the networks. And um, MTN and Safaricom then repli uh, replicated this, despite competing normally, and then they also arranged similar fares. Vodacom and Mozambique is trying the same at the moment by offering no roaming charges for going to South Africa, which many of Mozambican businessmen do. So these are things that uh, also arise out of competitive interactions and not regulatory foresight. I may have a question. Can, can you try to make the link between some, some policy by national governments and the output you just, you just uh, present? For instance, uh, it seems to me that there's a discrepancy very often between the policy, just like in South Africa, claiming they are no, the, using the usual rhetoric about universal service and not doing anything uh, yeah. Precisely. So they, this very uh, floppy uh, rhetorical, di uh, rhetorical discourse and nothing really happened. Is it, is it the same thing in, in other countries? Yeah, one of the difficulties is that uh, even for policies, they're being drafted by others, not by ministries. And uh, having a consultant coming in and drafting a policy and then it being signed doesn't mean much. So. Um, Africa is not very good in implementing policies, nor in writing their own policies, which is a, a big problem and a challenge that has to be addressed over the next couple of years to um, give some guidance in not whom to consult and, and who should be tasked to do it, but in developing their own policies and getting an example is Namibia, where the policy says the aim is full liberalization, but no one in government wants full liberalization. They're all still a little bit uh, leftish, but it says on the policy. It was drafted and approved and sounded good, but they weren't aware of what it meant. <coughs> Last question. For the few I know about Africa is that the, the countries with the most developed networks also happen to be ones that uh, has the reputation of having the more solid, in the case of course, one of the least weak institutions, maybe in Namibia and South Africa. I think there is a, a, a relationship between the, the strength of uh, institutions and society as a whole and the development of, uh, of uh, the industry. Yeah, my, my boss could probably talk about this topic for many hours. 
I, I'm not so much into institutional analysis, but uh, even in South Africa, which is fairly developed, the institutional setup is catastrophic and uh, limits all kind of progress in terms of uh, in, in the sector. And South Africa was leading maybe 10 years ago in terms of privatization and competition in the market, and now it's trailing behind in many aspects. LTE was first launched in Angola before even South Africa. South Africa lagged behind by half a year. And even Namibia had LTE before South Africa had LTE. And this was all a disaster about the spectrum auctions, which were organized and then recalled, and then operators decided to use the spectrum that they had already on 1,800. So this institutional issue and capacity is a big problem. In Cameroon, there is three or four regulators and three or four different ministries responsible for the ICT sector. And the president that has no grip over these different issues. So this would be the most severe case of institutional constraint. Okay, so let's, let's move to the next. I forgot to say something that is important. This is a session that we normally organize with in, co in close cooperation with a sister organization, um, CPR, CPR Africa, that could find it also representing TPRC and Enacon Redacom. And Raul nicely accepted to, to, to represent two, that is, Econ Redacom. He will speak about uh, national, uh, the agenda for Latin America and also TPRC for North America. <laughs> no, no, no. Well, well, it, you can go now or you can go in the end. I was fascinated by the points of coincidence with some of the things that you mentioned. Hopefully, we can see those. There's something here. We can start drawing the, yeah. the line between the dots. You have two parts. We give the first yeah, presentation yeah. about LATAM, and then we, yeah, we have um, okay. some questions, and you go back to, okay. to North America. Um, so, yeah, I call it the digital agenda in Latin America because I, I wanted to make it like seamless with the topics that we were dealing so far, although there's no such a thing as a digital agenda, as you all know. Neither there is in the United States, but nevertheless, trying to like bring it in a cohesive way. Um, this is the situation in Latin America. Uh, in the past two years, the, the sector has exploded. Uh, wireless, it's reaching saturation, 110% penetration, although bottom of the pyramid is still at 50%, but progressing. But that's the incomplete, the bottom of the pyramid. Um, fixed broadband growing at 18%, reaching 8.4 population, although Uruguay, which is the leader, is at 15% so far. So um, interesting, we're, we're gonna talk a little bit about what Uruguay is doing. And wireless broadband, a little bit the same sort of effect that you're talking about, and we are engaged into this whole substitution versus complementarity uh, assessment of market power because we see that mobiles they are taking quite a bit of the, of, the, of the broadband market, growing at 111%, reaching 20%. So 20% of the population. Uh, uh, granted, what I'm doing here on broadband, which is what the GSMA does, is taking connections for WCDMA 2000, HS, HSPA, and LTE. Um, we don't have data on smartphones. Some countries have dongles, but it's not very clear. So we'll, this is somewhat of a shortcut. Um, too many numbers, but here as you see uh, wireless penetration. You see the 110 percent um, for first quarter of 2012. So right now we are probably at 130 roughly. The, the, the whole issue then is connections, as you know. This is not individuals. Generally, when, when we start talking about dual SIMs, phone in the drawer kind of thing. Um, we, so we discount these 110 or 130 by, by 20%, roughly 20, 30%. So we would get to a, an 80% penetration roughly of real users. Um, and, and you see some countries like Argentina. Um, Argentina right now is at 140. Brazil grown dramatically, still growing at 17%. So, so this is, you know, uh, very big explosion of, of wireless. Um, and, and this is the incomplete. This is bottom of the pyramid. This comes from National Household Survey. So this is, you know, going and doing the survey. This is the statistical institutes of each of the countries. Do you have a wireless phone, yes or no? And, and there you see, like, the numbers. Although, see how it's progressing in the totals. Uh, and this is prorated average. It's 43% to 47%. So it's moving in the right direction. Clearly, um, the prepaid, and um, on the subsidies, on the handset side, 
it's, it's, it's definitely moving in the right direction on, on wireless. And this is, this is going to be where you're going to see the spillover effect that Christoph was talking about on the wireless broadband, which I think, well, it's coming in a few slides. Here's the fixed broadband. So here you get 8.5%, and this is at the fourth quarter of 2012. So it's pretty up-to-date numbers. Um, and it, it's somewhat uh, sort of tapering. Um, Uruguay is an interesting case, close to 15%. Uh, it's a combination of several things, but primarily you have a state-owned company that is offering a fixed broadband for free, meaning that if you have a, a, a wireline phone, they'll throw in a one megabyte, um, uh, one a megabit per second line for free, uh, just on a, on, in the bundle. And beyond that, um, something that I'm going to talk about later, which is a lot of public interventions, very uh, punctual, surgical public interventions offering like um, popular broadband offers at a much lower price point. And, and I'll tell you a little bit about what the effect are of those in the market as a whole. Um, and um, one of the problems that we have, and this goes back to the discussion that we were having before, is the demand gap. The demand gap is the difference between the coverage of the networks and the number of uh, people that are actually buying fixed broadband. And here, this is household numbers. The others were population. So you see, for instance, in Argentina, 90% of households could actually buy broadband, but you have 38% of households buying it, so you have a demand gap of 51%. Now, let's not think that this is just emerging market stuff, because if you go to Germany, Germany has a demand gap of 40%, meaning like if you look at the national broadband uh, plan for Germany, you see that coverage is very big and penetration. The United States has a broadband gap of, of 30%, a demand gap. But, but this is the issue. No? This is the issue of digital literacy. This is the issue of, of um, SME adoption, devices like um, uh, PCs and things of that sort. Um, but from a supply standpoint, the networks on the fixed side are there. Now, oh, the other one is affordability, obviously, the pricing. Notwithstanding what I said in the prior presentation, that affordability was tackled, in broadband there is still an issue. There's still an issue, and I think we were talking with Christoph before. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. But nevertheless, when you put the whole picture together on connections, the gray one is wireless broadband. The yellow is fixed broadband. So wireless broadband is really taking the lead in the region. This is what is, is growing. This is what is growing, and this is taking the, the growth pattern very similar to, to what uh, Christoph was talking about in Africa. Um, you have a certain level of complementarity, and this is what we're doing in the studies on significant market power uh, that we're doing right now to understand whether there is competition or not. And in some markets, you see the competition. But in others, it's just people couldn't have it, and now they have it through the, through the mobile device. Um, now, why did we have this kind of growth uh, in the industry? Well, first, liberalization of wireless. I mean, you, you got full competition. I'm going to show you some of the uh, HHI indexes. Across the, um, the, the, the continent, there has been liberalization. Second, you have platform-based competition. Very strong cable presence in Argentina, Brazil, Chile, uh, Costa Rica, and to a lesser degree, Mexico, Ecuador, and Peru. One of the things that is very interesting is that you got the cable industry, and then uh, Slim, Carlos Slim, through AMX, went and bought cable to compete with the fixed mobile. So he owns the cable, Telefonica, or someone else has uh, the, 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 um, the uh, copper uh, line, and they compete on a platform-based basis, infrastructure-based. Um, then, beyond that, and this is a very interesting effect, is the introduction of very low-priced broadband offers by government-owned telecom operators. Um, in some cases, Uruguay, Venezuela, Ecuador, and Costa Rica, the, the landline carrier is owned by the government. It was never privatized. And um, so when the National Broadband Plan came in, the government says, well, you're a utility, publicly owned, offer something to the benefit of the uh, consumers. So, for instance, one experiment we're doing in Ecuador, offering a broadband line at uh, $10 a month, really like cutting the prices by half. We don't know how much this is in terms of gaining market share, but the good thing is that they, 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 they play as a disruptor because the private sector then says, well, there's an offer for 10, I might as well start dropping prices. So in, in a way, the government intervention is not necessarily to gain share or really supply the market, but, but just to play as a disruptor in the market of fixed broadband. In the case of Brazil, it's very interesting because there's no government-owned uh, carrier, but 
the government sat down in the context of the National Broadband Plan with the four operators and said, guys, we need to come up with a low price offer. Negotiated and they got it. So, um, and there was a little bit of a quid pro quo coverage and things of that sort. The other thing that is occurring is reduction of taxes in telecom telecommunication services. In Brazil, for each dollar that you paid uh, in, um, in, in te telecommunication services, 40 cents went on taxes originally. So the government said, well, I mean, obviously, the total cost of ownership is too high. Elasticities are very high. Let's cut taxes. Now, that requires a lot of enlightened view on the part of, of the government because that means foregone revenues next year as part of the budget. But they did it. And, and, and the analysis was, whatever you lose next year as part of the budget, you're going to gain it not, not by a Laffer curve, curve, but because the, the pie is going to grow because of the spillover effects of telecommunications, and then you're going to collect taxes on the longer term. Brazil did it. Colombia did it on PCs. They cut all the import uh, taxes on, on PCs, although they are thinking right now on something. Some countries raised them. Like Argentina has a 21% tax on imported phones. Uh, every cell phone, 21%. Uh, the, the reason is they want to protect the national industry, but... Um, and, then, uh, and then the other effect is the national broadband plans, which are in most countries. And these national broadband plans are very interesting because in a way they work as, as a signaling device. It's the government saying, guys, we're engaged in a technology path, and the private sector responds to that immediately, like sort of investing. It's a, a little bit of the signaling that I was referring to before, where, where, where the role of government appears to be signaling of a certitude and, uh, and, uh, and uh, um, sort of like a frame of reference for technology development, a way by which the private sector can insert themselves and then propel their investment. So these are the five factors. Um, going back to uh, competition, these are the HHI indices on fixed broadband. And I, artificially, I put at 3,000 being the HHI, although you know the DOJ in, in the United States would argue that 3,000 is a little bit too generous. But nevertheless, you see platform-based competition. Argentina is a 1.3 1, 1 of, of HHI, of Herfindahl. Colombia is also low. So is Brazil, although the competition is slim there. Um, so is Costa Rica, and there is no slim presence there. A and then you get to situations of highly concentrated markets. But in some, definitely infrastructure-based competition is working. It's definitely working here. Um, in wireless broadband, um, uh, this is a trend. So there's a little bit of a spillover effect of what's going on in, 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 in the wireless market of, of HHIs into the broadband market. And this is very good because these should, I mean, let's, we'll show the data, how prices are dropping because of the competitive effect. Oops. Um, here what we're doing is, this is numbers, you can get it on the, uh, when, when I share the presentation, but basically it's all the HHIs. And what we're starting to do is now melding the fixed on broadband and, and the, on the mobile market in one. It's like a column number four considering that they are additive markets, that there's a single market, testing the, 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 the substitution uh, effect. Um, and obviously, let's say if Telefonica has X percent of share in fixed and X percent on mobile, we add them together, and we consider that as being a, a single market share to calculate the HHI. And you get some markets where you, you, you get pretty good competition, Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, uh, Venezuela, Although Colombia, the regulator said, hey, Slim, you have too much market power, and, and they started being very aggressive against American Mobile. So the regulators are really pushing for this and being very vigilant. Right now, I believe that there's three or four countries that are conducting SMP uh, assessments uh, to, to see whether there is uh, anti-competitive uh, anti practices. And, and so what you might expect is lower HHI, lower prices. Uh, and this is the data that you see on the left. You see fixed broadband, where whenever you have a lower HHI, you have a lower price for uh, some product. I don't know which one it is there. I think it's uh, the price for megabit. I think it's six meg product. And there we were testing whether there was some um, uh, melding effect of, of, of fixed and mobile. But then when you look at prices, wireless voice prices have been declining at 10. Well, they have nowhere to go. They can't go further than 10 because the effective price per minute is really dropping. Basic offers in fixed broadband, 17%. Uh, in general, 44% for medium speed, which is 6 megs. And um, although prices for, um, they are still high. We're talking about a GDP, an average GDP in the region of $8,200. So these prices are really high. All these are in dollars. There's no PPP adjustment. 
Um, when we compare within the region, we believe that PPP within the region doesn't count. But if we were to compare them with Europe, we should do that. And wireless broadband prices, 27% for dongles, 48% for smartphones. There's definitely a competitive effect. There's definitely a competitive effect, and definitely now we are starting to study your, your, your substitution effect that you were talking about, Christoph, for mobile broadband, how they are starting to capture share in some countries. They're really going after that market. Um, speeds are going up, and, uh, and partly because of platform-based competition, and some countries are deploying doxies, but you see Chile, Brazil, Argentina, and the Dominican Republic, they have products in the excess of 100 meg. This is doxies. Some countries having IDSL 2+. And, uh, and there's some fiber deployment. Like the Uruguayan carrier, it's full, full fiber. Uh, uh, Telefonica is doing fiber both in Chile's metropolitan areas and, and Brazil metropolitan areas. So we're going, some countries are moving to FTTH. Um, qu quite impressive. Um, and then you have this effect that I was talking about before, these popular broadband offers. Recognizing that $20 per, uh, for offer is too expensive, uh, you see a little bit of the ideological bend, no? You got Brazil with, with, with sort of a labor-like government, obviously Chavez, uh, Uruguay with a socialist uh, government, Costa Rica with a very strong labor tradition, and Ecuador aligned with Chavez. So there is a little bit of a, an, an ideological bend why, why which you see these kind of offers coming in. Uh, but Brazil also achieved it through the negotiation with the privately held carriers. Um, and so, so we see this as a very good uh, effect. Um, regulatory activity, quite strong, and uh, we've uh, grouped them in five, uh, yeah, five areas. Uh, competition with portability, uh, MVNO authorization, obligations on the dominant carrier, uh, price reductions at the classical expected things, except tax regime is not that expected, uh, but you see tariff controls, interconnection rates. Quality of service, big issue, and it's a little bit the notion of the sort of the derivative of the backhaul. Uh, discussion because with the, as you could expect the, the, the subscribers were growing this fast no matter how much capex you threw on the networks the saturation effect particularly on the mobile broadband started killing the networks the regulators picked up on that and in some cases they were ruthless like in Brazil they told the, the operators you cannot sign another carrier until your indicators show that the quality is improving but like that by court it was really, I, I had never seen something like as strong as that. But in many countries we have this problem of saturation because of, of the usage of the devices. And there's no matter how much capex you throw at a thing, there's still there's congestion. And um, a big thing in Latin America is, is, is the, the, the uh, robbery of, of, of devices. So a lot of governments are into the card registry, privacy laws as well. One country with a network neutrality law, one of the two countries in the world, in addition to the Netherlands, came up with a net neutrality law. Um, in fact, <laughs> the effect wasn't that good uh, for, for Internet. It wasn't that good, and uh, now other countries are looking at the net neutrality law in Chile. It has done bad, uh, a bad impact on the development of IXPs, transit prices uh, for Internet. So there has been some unexpected uh, consequences, unintended consequences on that law. So, but, but very active, the regulators, and what I see is increased technical capacity. I mean, there's over time, there's learning. There's learning, and uh, um, I think that there's less dependency on the consultant slash investment banker, lawyer, outside supplier, um, which I believe is good. There's less of a copying the neighbor. Uh, countries are less looking at each other, although they always look at Ofcom. They tend to look at Ofcom because Ofcom is the god, and they look at less the FCC because of the anti-American, but nevertheless, they are trying to see, well, what is our reality? What's the situation in our country? What can we do to meet the requirements? Um, national broadband plans, all countries have done it. And, and, and where we are at right now is getting to the point of um, defining speeds, getting more aggressive, and particularly decoupling the social impact from the economic impact. So broadband plans are starting, if you look at Costa Rica and Ecuador primarily, where the targets are defined, residential penetration, SME penetration, what kind of speeds, and then educational and health centers. So people are moving more into, um, well, what do we need of broadband to have an impact on export-oriented industries, key SMEs? What do we need for consumers? Let's draw the line. Hospitals, clinics, and uh, libraries, and, uh, and uh, schools, 100%. 
And, and interestingly enough, getting into more like a what's the usage levels, are we going to give him 20 meg or more? So people are really getting into the nitty-gritty of the broadband plans and not coming up with just purely ideologically driven uh, statements that are vague in nature. They're very granular in terms of the targets. But every country has them. Um, so the, con the, the result is where it's digitization, which is the other side of the coin of what I presented before. This is the evolution of digitization index in, in, in the top countries, granted. Uh, and you see they're moving uh, very fast. Um, some countries extremely fast, like Colombia was a disaster in 2004, and see where they moved. In a way, because when you talk to the policymakers there, they see these with, with, with another element of, they see these as another element in fighting or getting out of the civil war where they were at. If they can get some social cohesion and geographic integration through broadband inclusion, that could be another element that contributes to resolving some of the social tensions that they've had over the past 50 years or so. Uh, but anyway, everyone is moving in the right direction. And this is where Latin America is at 35 on an, on an average, and uh, yeah, how it compares digitization-wise with other countries. So, so big progress, big uh, uh, advances in the region, and, um, and I think that there's, everyone is very uh, bullish about it. I think that that's it, yeah. I don't know if there are any questions, or I so. jump to the US. Another developing country. <laughs> <laughs> Almost developing. <laughs> Um, yeah. Well, we can talk over dinner as well. I don't want to monopolize the uh, microphone. Uh, so the U.S. The U.S. is the same thing. The U.S. is like talking about a digital agenda is anathema. Talking about a plan in the U.S., talking about industrial policy, as you all know, is like, no, forget it. Let's stay away. The only reason why the U.S. got a national broadband plan was because when they were signing the, uh, the Recovery Act, uh, in the midst of the crisis, in the midst of the transition to Obama from Bush, they wrote a, li a little line in the bill that said, and as part of this, uh, giving you the $100 billion, you will write a national broadband plan. And probably the Republicans didn't even read that part. So suddenly when they got, elected, they got approved, okay, let's do a national broadband plan. That was the only reason. Uh, so um, there's no digital agenda, but I think that one can extrapolate from a bunch of things the de facto agenda. And the de facto agenda has these components in my mind. One is the BTOP program, which was the, um, the result of the American uh, Recovery Act. So the $7 billion that the government said was go they're going to invest in broadband. Now, let's remember, let's put this into context. $7 billion is a drop in the bucket because both cable and telcos private in, in the US invested in one year 49 billion. So seven is nothing, but the, we did a lot of noise around this. Um, the second one is, um, di uh, you know, it's like the digital dividend, so to speak, um, and shifting from analog to digital on the TV and then moving into high-speed wireless broadband services. Um, the E-rate was um, rekindling the program for schools and libraries. Uh, the National Wireless Initiative is getting the wireless people involved in developing uh, 4G services. Um, the House, so that's the lower house of, par of Congress, rejected net neutrality. I'll give you a little bit of a sense why they did that. Um, connect to compete is more of an economic impact. M shift of universal ser service fund from a wireline to broadband. And US Ignite is also another program for economic impact. So you could see that if you can draw the line between the dots, there's a little bit of an agenda, but no one will like to talk about an agenda per se. Um, the BTOP program then, as I said, $7 billion, um, $4 billion to support broadband, the rest to go into public computer centers and broadband adoption programs administered by the Commerce Department. And um, obviously the objective was to create jobs because that was in the midst of the crisis. We're at like 18% uh, unemployment, so we're going to create jobs. Let's put, well, obviously 800 billion of which a bunch was credit, uh, it was, uh, tax credits, but let's put seven into building broadband. The thing was that there was a big discussion. Well, how many jobs are we going to create? Because when you do the analysis, and we used uh, input-output tables as well, and say, well, let's put seven billion and, uh, to build broadband, 
in, in, in fact, I calculated seven, 6.3 billion. Um, so how, what is going to be the effect in terms of jobs? And uh, well, the number of jobs on the direct side was 37,000. Um, because it, that's a construction effect. It's the Keynesian thing, you know. You put seven billion people, dig trenches, put towers, do all these things. Well, primarily it's construction because of the sectoral analysis. Construction is the big beneficial for that. Well, 30,000. So when I put this uh, on, on the, the Republicans say, ah, oh, you see, I told you so. No jobs on this. And the Democrats <coughs> killed me because they say, no, there are more jobs than that. I say, well, I mean, this is the census data. This is as much as we can create. But there was a big issue about this. And um, I said, there are not many jobs that are going to be created. If we do it, we do it for social inclusion, but not for jobs. It's a social benefit. Uh, and then you had the spillover effects. Once you have the thing over time. Oh, here I was comparing. Well, how about if we were to put the money into roads and bridges? How about if we would send people to paint schools like uh, uh, FDR did with Hopkins? And, and the funny thing is that funny. I mean, it's not funny, but you create more jobs because the construction intensity of roads and bridges is higher than in telecoms because you have engineers on the other side. So again, the, the, yeah, the, the, some of the people didn't like the chart, but I say, hey, you know, it's like, it's, this is the data. This is the analysis. This is Kondratiev uh, input-output tables. This is not me. But they didn't like it very much. But the effects were definitely on productivity, on innovation, on outsourcing, gaining outsourcing, and then we came up with, with bigger numbers. So I said, you're not going to get them next year to solve for the um, unemployment. You're going to get it over time once you get the productivity boost on certain uh, sectors or innovation effect or on outsourcing, um, which is important, I think, a relevant discussion in Europe. I mean, I don't know to what extent these jobs are going to be next year. They're, they're going to be small, I think. Um, well, the next, then, E-rate, e that's libraries. Um, this is conventional. Let's put money in libraries and schools. This is fine. Uh, uh, wireless initiative, this, this one is important. 98% on four, uh, of Americans covered with 4G. So there's a big shift to go 4G. Now, granted, we call it, um, people in the U.S. call 4G a lot of things, like T-Mobile calls 4G. Uh, dual carrier HSP, HSPA, um, uh, while AT&T and Verizon call it LTE. Um, but nevertheless, they are moving to this next generation, and, and essentially what these meant is give more spectrum to the industry, the 500 megahertz for all the utilization that you're going to need. So, so that was very important. And the fact is, with the spectrum policy that they had, um, today we're 8% of the installed base on LTE, uh, which is the second country in the world. The first one is Korea with 28%. They are way ahead. But the, that's one of the success stories on LTE rollout because of the aggressive spectrum policy that they had. That's something that Europe should consider uh, clearly. Um, uh, then the net neutrality. When net neutrality was a political ploy, what happened was, and I don't know how many of you know this, but obviously Obama made it to the president with the support of Silicon Valley primarily Google, Facebook, and those guys. Those were the guys that created the machine that did all the micro data analysis that enabled them to tackle. Republicans control the House, and uh, those guys in Silicon Valley were arguing for net neutrality against the telcos. So the Republicans that wanted to be against Obama, they say, no, we're going to be against net neutrality because we're against Obama, therefore we're against Google and Facebook and the like. So they voted against net neutrality. Now, Obama threatened to veto this, uh, and, and sort of like this is the discussion where the FCC is, called in the, is caught in the middle as to whether they are supporting net neutrality or whether they are not supported, but it's definitely a political ploy. It's for the same reason that the Republicans are opposed to everything that Obama might say, and, uh, and this was one of them. Um, next, USF. Uh, USF, good move. Uh, $8 billion shifted to broadband and um, with objectives of cutting by half the number of Americans without broadband access by 2017. Again, drop in the bucket, but not that much because this goes to the unserved areas. And this is clear. The private sector will never go there, and this is something that uh, USF has really a, a good um, role to play. Um, let me just skip ahead. Um, 
one of the key issues in, in, in the discussion has been, uh, do we have enough competition in the wireless market? You remember when uh, AT&T wanted to uh, um, buy uh, T-Mobile that both the FCC and the DOJ stepped in and say no way. Um, this line, the blue line is the C4, which is the market shares of the four top carriers, and the, uh, the red one is the um, HHI. Um, and clearly you can see that concentration has been going on, and the regulator is saying, hey, wait a second. I mean, if, we, if, if AT&T buys T-Mobile, then we're going to three national carriers. Is there going to be uh, monopoly power or sort of like prices are going to go up? So they, they cut it. Um, what happened is if you look at the blue is HHI, uh, so it's more concentration. We are 2.5, and the red is the effective price per minute on voice. And I didn't have time to put the, the something measure um, dynamic efficiencies like, you know, uh, wireless data, ARPU, which gives you an idea of, of, of innovation. But prices are, they're not going up. I mean, they can't go anywhere because they are at five cents a minute. On, we're getting effectively to zero. And, uh, and, uh, but innovation keeps on going. So the argument of people saying, we, we are okay on, on, on concentration. We, we don't have a problem. And one of the reasons why we are okay is for, because of this um, chart. This is um, the, the scale curve of the wireless industry. And you have, the problem is that you cannot think about the country, the, the um, industry as a homogeneous um, industry. You have AT&T and Verizon that are at a lower price point with like m over 100 million subscribers. And then you have these low cost carriers that play the role of the disruptor that come at a very low cost because their business models are low cost. It's a little bit like the free versus France Telecom. And they keep these guys in check. These guys can respond because they have a low, lower unit cost. So in a way, the industry keeps on working well. Thank you very much, even though you have big market shares on the, ca on the part of AT&T and Verizon. So, so that's the reason why I think the market is, is fine right now, even though we have essentially, um, I would say, three, three large players, which is also something to think about in the case of Europe, because uh, coming from meetings, um, there, there's always a concern about how much we're pushing for this concentration. Is there a consumer uh, welfare risk or things of that sort? So net-net, digitization, the U.S. is still number 11. Uh, moving in the right direction, but clearly Europe is, is still ahead. Uh, partly it's the broadband effect. Uh, U.S. is 15 in broadband penetration and broadband adoption. Um, and, and, and one of the, interestingly enough, when you start teasing the analysis, one of the most interesting explanatory variables on broadband penetration is level of education of the household. So whenever we add the number of years of education per household, that explains like a ton of the variance on broadband penetration. And the U.S. is lagging. The U.S. is lagging on education. So no matter what we can discuss on, 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 on regulation and things like that, the fact is that you have to go back to basics, and that would help the U.S. move further up. That's it. And apparently Germany is, is also lagging on education because it was ranking pretty low, <laughs> which is kind of surprising. <laughs> okay, so let's have some questions about the two-sided two of, of the presentation. Well, since uh, we have uh, to have a better match to compare the U.S. with the whole of the European Union, have you done any analysis like this, uh, de-aggregated by a state, and then compare how individual states in the U.S. Com would compare to mm. the individual countries? In the yeah, and there, the story of the U.S. is the story of Europe. I mean, how Europe has been Approach and um, but but the, the 
different forms of this same kind of work. You can say, you guys are. I guess one of the advantages, and this is goes back to the NLP and the team, is that um, in uh, um, the national carriers are able to sustain more price pressure in, in some underdeveloped markets because of the cross subsidies supposedly that they get from New York and California. So they can go into uh, Alabama, Mississippi to sustain like, uh, a market that is constrained economically simply because they have the resources that they can pull from the other. And uh, I think that, interestingly enough, this picture has not made the regional carrier position, which I think is very interesting for Europe. This doesn't say that if you go to a European, suddenly uh, a single country carrier is going to disappear because they, if they re rekindle their business model, uh, the custom made for the countries that they serve, they can be very viable competitors to a pan-European carrier. So that's one of the things that, and I, I had them work for the regional level, they are very viable. They build on customer relationships, they care, they follow you the network, and applications customized to the particular state, things that are very interesting that the national carrier cannot do. And that's fine. So the national plays the scale game, and the regional plays the uh, fit with the local market. So that, that I think is an interesting thing. Scott Marcus, Vic. Uh, Raul, thanks for two wonderful presentations. Now, on Three. the- uh, on Three. Three, <laughs> yes, well, two in this session. <laughs> Great. Um, for the, uh, for the U.S. National Broadband Plan, I know I was struck, you know, from more from kind of an institutional design perspective, that they had that done by the, effectively by the independent regulatory agency. In most places, if they're going to do a national broadband plan, it would be done by the ministry, for which the most comparable organization in the U.S. would probably be the NTIA, which is part of the Department of Commerce. And if you actually go into the plan itself, uh, I, I, I know I've been struck with the fact that about 90 to 95 percent of what was recommended were things that were not within the ability of the FCC itself to implement. They were really things that would have to be done by other parts of the administration or, or, or by somebody else. You know, everything for d sort of demand stimulus training, um, you know, parts would be in Department of Agriculture and have been in fact in Department of Agriculture. My prediction when I first looked at it had been that uh, a lot of it wouldn't get implemented unless there was systematic attention to it. No, it has you're, you're absolutely right. Institutionally, I think it's a case study of, of mismanagement. Uh, with no single accountability. Um, they outsourced a lot to consultants where a ton of money of these seven billion went to pay uh, my former firm for, for consulting services. And, uh, and they, 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 you know, it's like, you know, when FDR had their, their counter-cyclical con thing, they put people to paint houses uh, the next day, you know? Here, the broadband is taking forever. But for things that you might Hello, uh, good afternoon. Uh, this is Jose Maria Castellano from the Universitat Pompeu Fabra. My question is related to these like broadband policy models. And also, Raul, I would like to ask you if you can tell us or is it is possible to establish type of different models in the region of Latin America 
on the one hand, we have this Bolivia, we have also Brazil, we have uh, Venezuela, that they are like doing like type of a uh, social broadband policy. But there are other models in the region, because uh, in the region, and also we can say that Chile is the opposite model from the point of view of leader country, also in the telecom, uh, telecoms, but with different type of, mm, is it in, a, in a different model. Uh, I, I got actually one remark and one question. Uh, the first one is, I mean, we shouldn't ask about countries, you said, right? But I mean, I have still a question because, or actually a remark, because the Netherlands most of the time is taking off one of the leaders. The Netherlands is one of the leaders in, 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 in uh, infrastructure, both in penetration, and in your uh, chart, it's actually very low, right? In the first one and this one is just uh, falling out of the top 20. There must be a reason for that, right? And it's probably something with an indicator. But just this one remark. And the second one, which is actually more important, is uh, you skipped a bit the discussion on uh, the r rural broadband plan in the U.S. You said, well, this was important because there was a market failure because nobody wants to invest, right? And I would be interested, I mean, uh, did you do any evaluation on these rural broadband initiatives? And if you didn't, I mean, do you have any idea in terms of indicators to use? Because, I mean, it's something that has to be over time, where it's in, in, the, in the small scale. In, in, the, in, the, in the U.S. In the U.S. You said, well, I mean, I, um, you made this very oh. advanced Kondratiev uh, 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 kind of analysis on the, on the national scale, but what is on the local scale? Because that's interesting, because, I mean, you could say, well, I mean, Skills are actually increasing, right? That's very good. I mean, is there something with uh, uh, SMEs do, doing something? I mean.
just want to pick up this last point. Um, it's a question addressed to the three geographical areas to the two speakers. Um, are you aware of uh, studies that um, uh, look at the consumer side and ask people wha what, what do they do on their mobile applications? What sort of services do they use? Because it seems to me that in the US, to begin with, uh, people like uh, the, 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 the kind of services and like the kind of freedom uh, that mobility offers to them. They like watching t um, movies um, uh, while being mobile. Um, and it also s struck me that it seems that people in Africa also like the same. So uh, perhaps it's a question of what do people prefer and the next business, business model should be based on what do people like, not what technology can offer. Maybe first for Africa. We're doing a household surveys uh, across 12 African countries, last in 2012, and we had a long catalogue of things that we were asking whether they would be doing it or not on the mobile phone, including browsing the internet, using it for emails, using it for social networking and so forth. And mobile applications is more something that is a more recent topic of um, BlackBerry becoming less of a significant player in the African market and Android phones became more popular, price dropping below 70 US dollars. And mobile applications were first only in the reach of very few people in Africa. And now it's becoming more and more mainstream and therefore applications become more and more important. But generally there is some applications which are cheap and they're cost saving applications such as Facebook Zero, WhatsApp, Skype, and so on. And then there's other applications that are very expensive to use. And uh, one of the key drivers was the user-generated content, the uploading of pictures, the uploading of stories, the, the whole social networking. But uh, watching videos would be prohibitively expensive in Africa. And uh, most people wouldn't be able to afford it for the next many years. Even video on demand isn't available we are fixed anywhere in Africa. So what, what you've seen in America and in Europe with triple play and quadruple play, that uh, hasn't happened yet. Yeah, yeah. So the demand would be very, very different. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, in, 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 in the US and in Latin America, 30% of the usage of smartphones is Facebook, 30%. Uh, um, and it could be that they are doing it for point-to-point -point communications through Facebook Connect. Uh, and, um, and then beyond that, obviously the, uh, the others. There's downloading of uh, uh, YouTube video clips that they do. And then all the user-generated content, um, that, that as well. Uh, the one thing that we, we sort of like, we didn't consider here is the tablet uh, usage because there you see more of the uh, movie stuff uh, on the tablet side. But obviously Latin America is still way behind on tablets and, uh, than the US. Um, but no, that's, that's the situation. And coming back to your point about uh, <coughs> who's doing surveys and data, you, and you, um, uh, obviously Blue is, is doing that with the survey. The, the last one hasn't been released, but you find a lot of information about uh, they're asking this question. Ron is also collecting some data about uh, what's happening in Asia, so you mm -hmm. can uh, mm -hmm. have it from Lynn Asia. The, the last one you released was what, what, one year ago? Yeah, so yeah, it's already yeah, and over. And Ofcom, you have some uh, elements that they're doing some, some survey as well. But it's, it's, it's very often pretty focused. So it's not covering everything, but it's far less comprehensive than what Pew Internet is doing. So maybe we can move to our last speakers uh, from South Korea, representing our colleagues from uh, CPR South. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm from South Korea, I guess the only South Korean uh, here. <laughs> okay, it's my name is uh, Myung Chul Park. It's Park is popular names in Korea. Uh, a new president of uh, Korea is, is President Park. Uh, he is woman, the first woman uh, president in Korea. Interestingly, uh, she was daughter of late Park, uh, President Park. 35 years ago, a dictator, but her daughter becomes another president in Korea. Anyway, Park is a very popular name in Korea. 
Okay. Uh, which one? Oh, this one. Okay. Uh, I'm trying to very briefly sketch ICT status in Korea and then try to review digital policy of Korea for the last 30 years. And then I tried to introduce two interesting case study, which are, uh, first one is problem the internet success as as how to how did you make a success story in, in Korean uh, market? Second one, uh, recently uh, we have some conflict between Samsung TV and KT, smart TV case, uh, network neutrality issues. And then I try to conclude uh, my talk. Uh, this is the, 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 the mobile phone. Uh, as you know, uh, Korea is a small country, but uh, population size of 50 million people. Is, uh, but at the moment, uh, more than uh, one of one of five, uh, more than one hundred percent, one hundred five percent, it's almost saturated. Sixty uh, percent uh, a smartphone business, uh, and then look at the broadband, the internet, uh, wide line internet is thirty-five, uh, which is almost uh, free, at least one one line per household. Uh, it's a fully uh, saturated. Uh, gas uh, is very much competitive for a uh, wireline uh, internet. Uh, for example, for me, I paid uh, seventeen dollars monthly charge. I enjoyed one hundred megabps. Uh, it's very fast, very 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 uh, cheap. Uh, and then these days, uh, listen to mobile internet very rapidly increasing. Uh, particularly LTE, almost thirty percent uh, uh, subscribers. Uh, LTE subscribers so very rapidly increasing. Yeah. As you know, uh, Korean market is very much dynamic. Even while, uh, even I'm Korean, but I, sometimes I cannot catch up the the, the, the speed. Okay, uh, this uh, there are three uh, smartphone subscriber. As I said, with 60 percent, smart pad, uh, iPad, uh, Galaxy pad, uh, only. 1.3 percent uh, total uh, more respect. It's still uh, a lot of room to for growth. Uh, uh, LTE, as I said, 30 percent, almost 30 percent uh, occupied. Uh, one interesting point is that we have three major carriers: uh, uh, SKT for the for the smartphone, SKT number one, KT number two, LG uh, number three. But a smart pad, KT is number one, uh, SKT is number two. For the LTE, SKT is number one, LG is number two, KT is the last one. A very interesting point, yeah. Uh, the evolution of wireless network in Korea, uh, the x-axis is where the transmission speed uh, in terms of megabps. Uh, the y-axis is the user's mobility. Uh, we have two approaches. Uh, the lower part is, is from the fixed wireless approach to the uh, 4G. We developed a, a, a Y Pro, a Korean version of Y Mix. Uh, another one, the upper line is called the mobile wireless. Uh, two, point two, two generation, 2.5, 3G, 3.5. Now we have 4G. But in Korea, at the moment, uh, mobile wireless is bigger. I guess uh, mobile wireless technology becomes the winner in the, in the Korean market. Uh, Digital evolution, uh, as you know, telco industry, airport industry is converged. Uh, each industry is evolved. Uh, telco industry, uh, the IPTV, internet TV, and uh, broadcasting industry, particularly cable modem, uh, try to, uh, to, to incorporate uh, 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 TPS, QPS services. Uh, we have uh, satellite and terrestrial uh, digital multimedia broadcast mobile TV in convergence between uh, two industry. The market changes, so we need the regulation should be changed. Unfortunately, a long time in Korea, regulation uh, broadcasting and communication separate. That's the problem we had. I will uh, address those issues uh, in another slide. Uh, this is uh, the, the, uh, the ranking uh, by the uh, 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 index uh, not so bad. As one one problem is uh, competition index is it become better uh, recently. Okay, let's look at Korean digital policy review for thirty years. Uh, 
we we can uh, think about the network perspective, device and media. Korea government is very successful in, in network perspective. Uh, in the early times, uh, we developed the T TDX, uh, Korean uh, data switching systems. By actually, we developed CDMA uh, for the first time in the world, commercial world, ADSL also, uh, 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 Vibro, Korean uh, version of YMAX, uh, and PC and broadband convergence network in Korean version also. Uh, now we have 4G, it's very successful in network expansion. Uh, device, uh, as you know, Samsung Electronics is very, very powerful uh, these days, smartphone and smart TV industry. Uh, but uh, very weak in media and software. So uh, we are, we are uh, in the pro some problems in, 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 in software industry in Korea. Uh, let's look at how government played role in, in, in during the last 30 years. Uh, if you look at the, the, the slide, the, the left-hand side, uh, the first implementation plan, uh, it's it, uh, uh, Framework Act on Implementation, Promotion, and Committee is prepared. Uh, it was successful in uh, 1999, Cyber Korea, uh, uh, building high broadband uh, integrated so ISDN, uh, broadband ISDN, uh, and, and e Korea version uh, uh, with high speed internet penetration and fostering entire nation's implementation, uh, implementation literacy. Then we try to catch phrase U Korea. Then uh, recently we uh, catch phrase Smart Korea. The first part we try to develop IT sector by, 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 by itself. The second part we try to converse with other, other industry. That's a different uh, focus. Uh, this is my uh, evaluation of the last 30 years uh, government law. Uh, uh, we change government names very often. Uh, uh, long time ago, we have Minister of Communications, uh, KII Korean Information Infrastructure Plan. Uh, they were very successful, fast followers, but uh, still late movers. If you look at the second column of table, uh, because of that, uh, Korean government changed the 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 the. the, the, the Minister, uh, Minister of Information and Communication, the more uh, bigger uh, uh, minister, uh, focusing on Cyber Korea, E Korea, U Korea uh, until 2007. Uh, so we have broadband, uh, in fixed internet, penetration high, mobile telephony, Vibro, we developed Vibro HSDPA, the, the, uh, mobile TV. Very much successful, but uh, as I said before, Broadcasting industry, it, communication industry is separate. So conversion services has problems. For example, IPTV. Uh, we had technology IPTV uh, suppliers already for more than three years because uh, government fighting each other. Who should control? Who should give a license? That's the big issues. So they, they, uh, they had to wait uh, for more than three years in, in the market. Market was already, but uh, Government was not ready. Uh, because of that, in uh, 2008, uh, previous government uh, changed the government structures. They combined two organizations, uh, MIC and uh, KBC, Broadcasting Commission, together to, to speed up uh, conversion services between two industries. Uh, that is Smart Korea, uh, Broadcasting Communication and conversion uh, 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 happened. But the problem is, uh, problem is uh, 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 contents, uh, platform, network, device separate by uh, the other ministers. This is very not effective uh, 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 in industries. So uh, 2013, this year, March, new government started, uh, President Park, uh, reorganized uh, the government minister again, uh, the new minister, minister of Future and Creative uh, Science 2013. They combine uh, uh, all. Uh, they combine all all CPND function in one single semester, sing, single minister. It's, it's a uh, very big uh, organization. Ministers. Uh, uh, one of my faculty in my department to become the minister mm -hmm. last week. He was appointed uh, by the minister. It's a, 
uh, a long-term friend. Uh, well, he is responsible to create many jobs uh, through this ICT convergence. Uh, that's a big uh, challenge. As uh, we have some uh, mixed success uh, for the last uh, 30 years, uh, we'll address uh, later again. Okay, I'll skip this. I have two public case studies. First one, prevent internet access. Uh, in 1994, uh, 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 ISTN technology was available in, in Korean uh, internet connection market. KT is pro, uh, the, the dominant carrier. 1998, uh, uh, the cable modem technology was used in Korean uh, market. But uh, 1999, uh, a big thing happened in Korean market. ADSL services introduced in for the first time in the world in Korea. Uh, quickly, uh, the, the number of subscribers become 10 million. After two years, uh, it's become double 20 million. After three years, it uh, become 30 million. Very fast uh, diffusion. Uh, 2006, FTDH, Wibro, HTTPA, available, 2012 LTG services available. Let's see how ADSL started in Korea. There is some, some hidden history, I will tell you. Uh, at that time, KT was market leader. Uh, Hanra Telecom recently changed their name, company name is SK Broadband. Hanra Telecom got licensed from the government uh, as a, a second local service provider. They had vision to, to, to cover all the, all, all the Korean uh, uh, territory uh, using the new technology WLL, wireless local loop. They trying to cover all houses in, in Korea. But as you know, at that time, the technology was non unstable. Too much money, too much investment. They failed. Because of that, they almost broke up. They should find another uh, killer business to survive in the market. Uh, they focus on internet connection. At that time, 1999, uh, internet connection is very early. Uh, uh, but uh, available technology at that time is ISDN. Unfortunately, KT has no technology. Cloud Telecom cannot compete with KT, with ISDN. So they have to find more innovative approach. That is ADSL. As you know, ADSL is at that time, only at the lab level uh, tested model, not commercially tested at all in the world. Or, of course, it's very expensive technology. But uh, to survive in the market, Hanover Telecom adopted this uh, very risky option. That's the history. But uh, after uh, Hanover Telecom made some success story in the market, KT changed their, their strategy. You can see uh, the next slide. This is KT commercial message. Uh, now KT is the uh, dominant carrier in, in, in internet access. But still, uh, uh, Hanno Telecom is, is good, uh, uh, good play in the market because they're first mover in the market. Uh, as you know, ADSL services, uh, the, the catalyst of services quality, QS, is, is dependent on, on the distance from central uh, station, uh, central uh, telephone office. Uh, look at the, 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 as I said before, the Korean is small countries with large population. So, uh, the most people are living in within uh, four kilometers. Ninety-five percent people living uh, within within four kilometers. That's very uh, good uh, choice for, uh, for Korean territory. Uh, I my analysis uh, how we make a success story uh, in terms of three uh, dimensional uh, policy, demand side, and supply side. Uh, 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 I, I focus uh, on the government law. 
because this is we are talking about the government uh, the policy uh, perspective. As you know, this is, is typical curve of the new service deployment. Uh, uh, typically, uh, there is some chasm. Uh, some services are slow start, but sometimes goes up. But some services goes up, but pretty goes down and failed. So to, to diffuse very quickly, the government should play some role. So I will analyze those rules in terms of this graph. First, policy perspective, government roles. Government plays uh, early times, uh, uh, early adopt play. Most schools are public agency connected using ADSL. Broadband service adopted early by all the government uh, body. The public awareness program is promoted. As you know, uh, uh, Korea, South and North, uh, competition, military competition, so every male person should serve our country for two hours, three, uh, two years, three years. I, I support my country for three years. So military education is very important. We can educate military persons at all, and when, when the, uh, they finish uh, services, they may use uh, ADSL, uh, the internet services in, 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 in job. All right? So military education programs and, and housewife education programs were uh, very promoted by the government. Also, for competitive uh, telecom policy was uh, a very good uh, timely policy. Liberalized entry and forbearance in regulation and and facility based competition was introduced. In Korea, uh, local law unbundling uh, very lately uh, introduced 2000, I guess, 2003, 2004. So early times, if, if you want to play in the market, you have to use, build your own facility. That's the, uh, the, the, the policy. Also, very cost effective incentive. As you know, PC was expensive at that time, so government tried to develop a low priced PC, the internet PC. And then also cyber building certification programs. Programs uh, government uh, certificate some some apartment, so try to uh, add the values uh, in house housing uh, apartment. That was uh, very uh, effective. So let's look at uh, the other side, uh, demand side. Uh, as you know. Uh, there are very active customers in Korea, particularly young generation. Uh, they are uh, uh, enthusiastic adoption of new services, very, very, very uh, lively uh, adoption. Uh, I don't know how many of you know about Bali, Bali cultures. Korean people are very uh, hasty kickback services, where if you ask subscription on morning, we have to get the services in the afternoon. Otherwise, they change. If, Think about uh, if you visit uh, some, uh, if you go to the restaurant, people typically uh, do not wait more than 10 minutes. It's very, 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 very hasty uh, cultures. But it's no good, but uh, for the uh, ICT development, it was a good, a good engine for, to, to dip, uh, diffuse the services. Also, many kill applications fully utilize the, the network uh, capabilities. Uh, popular online games, uh, extensive use of IT in the education. As you know, Korean people is very uh, 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 spend a lot of money in the children's education. So they use ICT uh, in education, children's education. There are many, so many programs uh, available in ICT uh, that they are uh, using a uh, network. Internet broadcasting stations, also online stock trading widespread at that time, 1999. Also, we have intermediaries boosted the wholesale demand. PC cafe becomes popular because uh, early times the cost was expensive, so we need a PC cafe to use to access network. As you know, at that time, venture boom with that companies promoted awareness in, 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 in Korean market. Some, some, some bubble, but uh, anyway, uh, it just played a role to, to, to diffuse services uh, in the market. For the supply side, uh, as I said before, uh, Hano Telecom, local competitors, they need adopt more innovative approaches to survive in the market. Otherwise, they almost broke up. 
Uh, so facility-based competitive network building uh, was uh, effective. Uh, geographical advantage, so most people are living uh, within four kilometers of sun, uh, 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 central office. That's, this is very uh, uh, good for ADSL technology. Uh, low usage charge and dropping cost. Uh, we have a good cycle. Uh, low, uh, before, before ADSL, the price was very expensive. Uh, the, uh, the price was a uh, uh, message-dependent service price. But uh, in this case, flat rate services. So HANA Telecom set the price very uh, cheap. Because of cheap price, many subscribers increased. And then, by, by the economic scale, the average cost uh, decreased. So we have a good cycle. That uh, makes a good success story in, in supply side. Uh, these three uh, uh, policy demand the supplies are well fitted. So let's summarize our discussion, the lessons from Korean case. All attributes fitted the policy demand the supply. Policy, they align incentive for all key players in the market. Uh, suppliers, uh, consumers, also they are played early adopters. Demand, target for attract services, kill applications popular. So it was good. Uh, there was young uh, 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 early adopters. Supply side, uh, the competition policy, facility-based competition policy was effective in the early times in Korea market. Timing, coordination, also important. important. Uh, we can summarize, need to reach critical mass as possible as possible to make a success story in, in for the new services. And sequence, less important, the chicken or egg. Early times, early, early times, uh, cost was uh, a lot uh, uh, expensive than price, but they can make a profit within, uh, within uh, two years later. So we have a good cycle. Uh, uh, the, the last, but the most important, make small success to build momentum. Uh, so th this is my analysis for uh, broadband internet access. Okay, second one is Samsung TV and Smart TV case. Uh, this uh, KT claims Smart TV, uh, heavy traffic, uh, making internet speed low. So they said Samsung should pay some, some money for the network uh, construction. The provide issues of network maturity but Samsung did not uh, accept this idea. The, there is a lack of evidence that a smart TV caused heavy traffic because they cannot, couldn't access a traffic measurement they don't, didn't believe. Smart TV blocking would affect negatively national ICT development. Heavy traffic caused by smart TV users, not by Samsung itself. Finally, we have some uh, happening. Last year, February 10, suddenly KT blocked Samsung TV smart traffic. The many consumers complain about this to the KCC, Korean Communication Commission regulators. Uh, KCC uh, uh, gives some warning to KT Four days later, KT unblocked uh, uh, this uh, traffic. But the interesting thing is, the test KT, LG, another player, did not join this, 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 this blocking. Uh, uh, but KCC uh, trying to uh, recommend the Samsung to actively participate in, in discussing the net neutrality in Korea. This is, is, is event, uh, uh, as, as you can see, the, uh, the uh, red line, uh, Korea Telecom uh, blocked uh, Samsung uh, Smart TV's connection uh, before the uh, first discussion of KCC, which was able to be added in the five days, Samsung electronic second uh, injunction in against the KT in the court. KT unblocked Samsung on TV's uh, connection uh, after uh, four days later. Samsung Electronics withdrew 
injunction. Uh, uh. And then uh, some months later, uh, KCC warned KT that violating user agreement with the Telecommunication Business Act. KCC recommended Samsung should actively participate in, in discussing net neutrality. Uh, uh. But still are uh, ongoing issues. Uh, uh, well, still, uh, they, are, they are negotiating. Uh, this is still live issues in Korea. The government will handle these issues. Uh, let me conclude uh, 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 the, my talk. Uh, two things. First one, very frequent government organized changes, mixed success. As I said before, uh, early times, we increase telephone uh, facility uh, supply, but uh, as past follow good, but uh, late movers still in, the, in, in worldwide market. So our government uh, uh, changed MIC, very successful as fast follow, but a convergence service delayed between broadcasting and communications. Because of that, uh, 2008, government changed a KCC, they combined together. MIC plus uh, KBC, Broadcasting Commission, together becomes a new entity, KCC. Broadcasting communication uh, services are combined but the problem, CP and D is separated, not effective control. So now, 2013, new government body is created, a Minister of Future and Creative Science. CP and D integrated, but they have to find, uh, create many jobs in the market for the, uh, for the next uh, uh, growth in Korea. Second one uh, is Giga Korea. Uh, from now on, 2013 to, 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 to 2020, next eight years. My, our objection is, uh, target is fixed network up to 10 gigabps. Currently, we have uh, a 100 Mbps popular in, 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 in most house. Mobile network, uh, one gigabps, very ambitious plan. We have to develop all the technology, uh, device, software, uh, platform, contents, network technology to improve uh, to, to obtain this kind of uh, target. Uh, that's uh, 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 my presentation. Uh, this is the last one. Gangnam Style. Okay, uh, thank you so much for my presentation. Thank you. Um, I'm sure you have a lot of questions to, to offer about all these delicacies of uh, Korean policies. Scott? Hi, Scott Marcus. Once again, thank you. This is fascinating. Um, now, uh, I know a lot of European and, and American experts seem to assume, I think wrongly, that, the, that uh, Korea was subsidizing last mile. I know you, that, that, there, that there were subsidies paid for last mile. My impression is that there was nothing paid for last mile from the government. There was, I think, some subsidy for intercity fiber network. Is that right? I, I read that, I think, in a ministry publication in the early 2000s. No, there is no subsidy to the, to the, to the last mile. Uh, maybe uh, some 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 uh, local government try to make their own network to to. The, or, or for example, in, in Korea, you can find many public uh, free Wi-Fi available in most uh, locations, public place, uh, even in uh, in department uh, uh, department uh, or cost station or in underground. Or every, every, everywhere are the public. Uh, in that case, uh, the local government may provide uh, those kind of support, but not to the uh, user uh, users directly. Yes, yes. Thank you. I also th thought that was um, excellent presentation. It was delightful, <laughs> especially the videos. <laughs> but not only that, the content. I want to ask a question about um, the institutional setup. 
There are some people who might look to Korea and say, well, government was very involved, and yet you produced in a hugely competitive market. How is that possible? In, in, the, in the West, we would say as soon as government starts meddling and regulating, everything goes haywire and you get all sorts of distortions in the market. So could you comment on the different way of seeing it? Yes. Uh, well, in, in Internet access, uh, broadband Internet access, uh, as I said before, there's not much regulation in the early times. It was a so successful market did uh, itself. Uh, it becomes competitive. But some other services, uh, local telephone or some other uh, mobile phone, still uh, we have uh, three, three major players uh, strongly uh, regulated uh, by government. But yes, I, 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 I think uh, in other sectors, but still uh, the market did, did not uh, play it as well. Uh, uh, yeah, yes, there's some problem in, in other some, some part of market. Uh, but uh, what, in, in most Korean people expect uh, uh, government should play a great, uh, great role in, in, in particular for new services. But yeah, there is some, 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 some dark side also we have, yeah, definitely. software gap that you identified and problems with software. Uh, we've, in the earlier speculation, we say uh, if we build a very high capacity uh, network, uh, this should uh, drive demand. So supply uh, leading demand, supply uh, leading also supply of software so that in principle, if we're a technology leader in building capacity, uh, that should stimulate uh, uh, a supply of software. But as you observe, that's not quite happening, although I think we could understate the contribution of Korean massively multiple games, which are very actu actually very important, okay? But in many other areas of software, we're not seeing performance that's satisfying uh, to uh, Koreans, so w why? Uh, is it an industrial structure problem, an entrepreneur uh, kind of problem? Why uh, the lagging in software? Yeah, software is, is a long time uh, uh, headache in Korea. Uh, every government tried to uh, uh, try to give some competitive uh, software industry, but every government failed. Uh, but this uh, this time, new government start again. Uh, one of my faculty member become minister. He, he is responsible to increase competitive software industry. I guess uh, where uh, where uh, most of software company in Korea is, is uh, Jeb, uh, conglomerate uh, subsidy, as you know, SDS is subsidy of Samsung, with LG. Each each is the Jeb, uh, conglomerate uh, has uh, subsidy uh, software company. Uh, they, they work for their own uh, mother company. They don't have any competitiveness in, 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 in other uh, sectors. So because of that, uh, try government, uh, government tried to, to make uh, software, small, medium-sized software, uh, but uh, it's not easy to survive in the market uh, because big, comp big companies try to give uh, all, all the work to the, their own subsidiary. It, it, uh, it's a problem, so government control, uh, try to regulate, uh, but uh, it's not so efficient so far. But uh, from now on, uh, new government try to increase software. But embedded software, as you know, embedded software is a little bit uh, strong uh, than uh, for Samsung. Uh, tried. Big companies, no problems. As you know, in Korea, uh, the, the most uh, uh, product is exported to the other countries. The big companies are very successful, for example, Samsung, LG was good. But small and medium-sized company, not many. That's our, our job we have to do, yeah. Uh, Jean -Paul. Uh, just as a follow-up, uh, it sounded as if you were answering that industry structure and vertical integration were the right. issue at hand. Uh, so is the government willing to step in and say, 
Mr. Samsung, I'm going to decrease structural separation or divest, or uh, will they do something like that? Uh, uh, this, this was a big issue for the last presidential election. Every candidate tried to think about these issues. We have to control, we have to break up big company in smaller, as you know, it's not easy job. Uh, even President Park uh, announced uh, economic, uh, democratic, democratic of economic, I uh, tried to think about uh, the, the distribution, uh, income distribution or the revenue distribution of the industry, uh, but, uh, well, many, many, many candidates promised but they didn't implement. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. They are too big, too powerful. Some prime minister retired and go to Samsung. <laughs> <laughs>